So today, I have a very special guest. This is Dr. Annetta Langer-Gould. She's the Regional Lead for Clinical and Translational Neuroscience for the Southern California Permanente Medical Group and a practicing multiple sclerosis specialist at Los Angeles Medical Center. And I should also add a guru at epidemiologic research and evidence-based medicine. Thank you for coming on and answering our questions about COVID-19. You're welcome. This is, this is going to be fun. <laughs> It's a, it's a crazy world out there. I feel like COVID-19 is taking over everything. I was going to go to a spring training baseball game, Angels versus Dodgers. I was going to go to the American Academy of Neurology Conference in Toronto. Everything is canceled. Yep. That's, yep. It's spring break for our kids, and everybody's home uh, homeschooling, and we're all fighting for the Wi-Fi. So. All right. Um, so, you know, people know a lot about this, but can you just give us a little bit of a general background on, on COVID-19 and why should we be concerned about it? Yeah. So, I mean, this, the, the reason people are really worried about this virus is that it's really contagious and it's spreading really rap rapidly. And also we know that the spread is preventable if most people commit to social distancing and sheltering in place where it's necessary. I think it's important to remember that in most of us, if we, if we were to get infected, we're going to end up having nothing worse than the flu. But in people who are older or have underlying risk factors, health, health conditions like COPD or um, other lung diseases, diabetes, um, or are on really strong immunosuppressants like people undergoing cancer therapy or transplant recipients, their mortality estimates um, could be their, their mortality estimates could be as high as 15%. So the, right now what we know is that it's killing any the, killing anywhere from 1% to 15% of people depending on their underlying risk factors and their ability to get adequate health care. The other big problem with this virus is that it's spreading so rapidly that and people are getting sick at the same time in a lot of countries and have overwhelmed their health care systems. As we know in the United States, our health care system is a lot more fragile um, than the one in Italy or France where the, and Spain where the outbreak is currently taking hold. And the problem with that is if too many people get sick at the same time, we're going to run out of protective equipment, which puts our healthcare workers at unnecessary risk, and we're going to run out of ventilators, which means we'll have to choose and choose very quickly who we're going to try and save and who will not get that chance. All right, thank you. And uh, how do we think, I know this is a new virus and we don't know that much about it, but how do we think it's spread from person to person and what are the basic things we can do to avoid coming into contact with it? Right, so this is, um, it's, it's, it's droplet transmission, so if that means basically when somebody who's infected coughs or sneezes, um, they release, it, you know, droplets that contain the virus, the other term people are using is called it's aerosolized, um, and that can either land on people who are standing with, typically within three feet of the person who sneezed, but they can also land on surfaces. And people, you know, we all have sort of a habit. We touch something, then we touch our face, we stick our finger in our, you know, we rub our eyes, we pick our noses, um, we wipe, you know, we wipe our mouths or we eat. And that's another way that you can transmit it from um, a surface that had been in contact to your mouth or nose or eyes. Um, there's a really interesting study that actually just got published yesterday in the New England Journal that tells us a little bit more about how long the virus actually lives. So what they showed in this study is that the viruses can still be transmitted in the droplets in the air up to three hours after someone who is infected coughs or sneezes. The other thing the same study showed was that you can detect the virus it's still in, that's um, still alive, could, so could still potentially infect someone three days uh, after three days on stainless steel and plastics and up to 24 hours later on cardboard. What's that mean practically? It means that transmitting the virus through touching cardboard containers is less likely than touching it through plastics, like including styrofoam. Um, but, that, but it also means that it's living a lot longer outside than we had initially thought. Um, so, I mean, I think that's really important for people to remember when this outbreak started, we were thinking that, you know, three hours to one or two days, and now we have some data showing that it could actually be all the way up to three days. Um, so, to be really careful about touching surfaces, um, particularly when we're out in public places, um, that, you know, you really have to think about the, the fact that you're not, you're touching, like when you're touching that keypad at the grocery store, it's the, it's the 
all the people who touched it in the last three days unless it's been adequately sterilized in between. Okay. And now, you know, I do want to give the caveat that we're going to talk about some of the medications a little bit. And, you know, we're not your doctors. We're just giving general information. So we would highly recommend you talk to your own provider about making decisions about treatment and things like that. Uh, but just, we'll talk about the medications. But just to start, does MS itself make people more susceptible to COVID-19 or are they likely to get a relapse if they get COVID-19? Yeah, that's a, that's a really um, good question. I've been getting that question a lot from my patients. Um, MS itself is not, does not make you immunocompromised. So just having MS is not going to increase your risk of getting COVID-19. But I think importantly for some of my patients, smoking certainly does. And, and that includes marijuana and includes vaping. So um, that's, that's far more important than having MS. Um, in terms of triggering relapse, we don't know. I mean, there's no data, but I think it's unlikely. So far, this hasn't been reported. Of course, the biggest outbreak and the most data we have is from China, where not a lot of people have MS. Um, but in Italy, there are quite a number of people with MS, and they do have a very well-organized group of researchers. Um, and we haven't heard any reports of COVID-19 triggering MS relapses. So I think that's pretty reassuring. That is reassuring. It is amazing the number of publications in COVID-19 that are coming out in such a short period of time. So it's really good that scientists are really trying to help us understand this very, very quickly. Now let's just talk about a few of the medications. Uh, what about the older injectable medications like interferons, rebifix, stavia, beta seron, or glutyrimer acetate, copaxone, glutopa? Do you think these medications would be dangerous given the COVID-19 outbreak? I don't. Of course, you know, with, with all of these questions, we don't actually have any data on this. But So we're basing all of this on um, the mechanism of action of the medications. Um, so uh, if you hear background noise, my kids are home. This is what's going on. <laughs> you know, everybody's okay, trying to ahead. get snacks and do their homework in online school. But in any case, so for people who are on interferon betas or glutyrum or acetate products like Copaxone or Glotopa, I don't think you're at higher risk, and I think you should continue to take these medications. If you're really nervous, you can talk to your doctor about it. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that the interferon beta is actually being tested right now as a potential treatment for severe COVID-19 lung infections in randomized controlled trials in Europe. Um, as most of you probably remember, interferon beta is a protein that your body makes naturally in response to viral infections. and so. We do have some old data that suggests that it may actually lessen the severity of viral illnesses, and that's certainly what they're trying to test in COVID-19 patients. So, and, gl and the glutyrimer acetate products, I don't think they'll have, they're not going to help, but they're not, certainly not going to hurt either. Okay, and how about, what about the S1P receptor modulators like Gelenia fingolimod or Sipanamod? Uh, what do you think about those medications? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when we think about what, you, when we just take a step back and talk about, like, what are these medications doing and what does our immune system need to do to fight off viruses in general? So for our, for our body to be able to fight off viruses, the most important mechanism is our T-cell dependent pathways. So you need a healthy number of T cells circulating around that function normally to be able to clear the virus quickly so that you end up with a really mild case or certainly not a particularly severe one. So again, you know, we don't have any data on this, but we can back up and make logical guesses from the way in which the drugs work. Um, in terms of that, you know, Frangolimod or or Simponimod, otherwise known as Jelenia or Amazent, I mean, these are drugs that we know trap your T cells into your lymph nodes and with longer use probably also kill off important um, groups of memory T cells that help you fight off different types of viral infections. So I would be quite concerned that patients who are on these kinds of drugs that keep you essentially, keep your, keep your T cells out of circulation would be at risk of getting a more severe infection if they were to be exposed to COVID-19. So in those patients, you know, I think it's really important that you do everything you can to minimize your chances of getting infected. Okay, and okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the fumaric, fumaric esters like Tecfidera or Vumerity? What are your thoughts on those medications? Yeah, so, so these are, you know, so that's another good question. Again, we have no data on um, what they do, but we do know that um, that a lot of our, the drugs that we use, including Tecfidera, um, uh, do increase the risk of PML and they can cause lymphopenia. So that tells us already that they have the ability to interfere 
with, um, with T cell mediated mechanisms for fighting off viruses. So I would be concerned, again, in patients on these medications that they would be at higher risk of having a severe disease course um, if they were to get infected. Okay, and particularly, how about the, yeah. particularly with what? Particularly if they're lymphopenic, you know, if their blood count is that their lymphocytes are suppressed. Yeah. If the lymphocytes are normal, would that be reassuring or you would still think there's some concern there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's still some concern because we know that not all of the PML cases associated with Joenia, um, I mean, sorry, associated with um, Tecfidera occurred in the setting of lymphopenia. So it seems to have other effects on T-cell function um, that uh, uh, independent of just lowering the actual counts. Okay. And how about a Abagio or teraflunamide, the other oral agents? What do you think about that one? Yeah, that's a tough one because it's, a base, it's essentially a low-dose chemotherapeutic agent. Um, it does impair T cell function. That's why we give it. Same thing with drugs like azathioprine, Imuran, otherwise known as Imuran or Cellcept. I mean, methotrexate. Um, all of those are sort of low dose chemotherapeutic agents. The reason it's so tough is because the the way in which they work. You know, usually it takes like three months before they really start to work. So even if you stop your drug today, the the effects that um, the effects on your immune system are likely to last, you know, a good three to six months, particular with abagio or teflunamide. Um, we know that has a super long half-life and that it's not completely out of your body for two years after your last dose unless you undergo rapid chelation therapy. Okay, and now to move on to a different class of medications, how about the B-cell depleting agents such as Ocrevus, Rituximab, and, you know, the soon-to-be FDA-approved Ofatumumab? What do you think about those medications? Yeah, I mean, it, so so we don't actually know exactly what role they, these cells play in fighting off COVID-19. Um, you know, we can extrapolate from other viral infections where we know that these cells basically are minor players at best in limiting disease severity. So you're not necessarily at higher risk of getting infected. Um, what we know about other coronaviruses is that these, the B cells' main role is really in mounting an adequate antibody response um, and that and being able to maintain the, the, um, the virus into its latent phase. To do this, you actually only need a few circulating B cells. Um, so for people who are on these treatments, as long as your B cell count is greater than 20 cells per mi microliter, it's un extremely unlikely to increase your risk of getting COVID-19 or even having a more severe disease course. Um, I should say, though, we should, you know, there's a caveat here about trans about um, extrapolating data from one virus to another, even in the same family, like the SARS coronavirus to COVID-19. Because one thing we know is that all the viruses, particularly ones like this that are, you know, can live in a host for a relatively long time and spread easily, they have a special way of evading the immune system. So we could, you know, if we're wrong and the B cells is one of the mechanisms by which it evades the immune system, then maybe it is maybe it is important to let people have normal B much higher levels of B cells. Um, for people on these drugs that have B cell counts that are um, less than twenty, at least in theory, you could have a more prolonged course of the disease, and you should be taking extra um, extra care to avoid exposure to COVID nineteen. Yeah. Now I know that you're involved in the Combat MS study in collaboration with Sweden. And yeah. we have some data that suggests that holding rituximab for a period of time may be very safe with the very low risk of relapse or return of disease activity. Is that right? Yes. So um, the, the um, group out of Stockholm has already published one paper sh um, for patients who've stopped for a variety of reasons. They were getting infusions on average every two years, and no one really had much in the way of return of disease activity. That's certainly been our experience in Kaiser, Southern California as well, that we have plenty of people who have stopped for a variety of reasons or we now have on every one or two year infusions and their disease remains controlled. Um, we, have had a couple, we have had a couple patients get relapses, um, but they don't get rebound relapses. They just get um, mild relapses after about two and a half to three years after stopping the drug. Um, so it's a little bit, it's very different than um, Jelenia or Tysabri where, you know, a real concern is that if you stop those medications abruptly without talking to your doctor, you could actually end up having a really severe MS relapse. Um, so I wouldn't advise that anyone discontinue that with the, 
with rituximab, we certainly um, are advising people right now to hold off on getting any infusions um, before June. We can reassess the situation and then certainly not to get another infusion um, if their B cell counts are still less than 20. Okay, and then the highest risk category of medications is probably medications that actually deplete T cells, which would be things like Lemtrada, Alemtuzumab, or Cladribine. What do you think about those medications? Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, any drug that completely knocks out your T cells is going to put you at pretty high risk of getting the virus and getting a really severe case of that. Um, you know, extrapolating from other viruses, we know that there are very severe cases of herpes encephalitis. Um, and um, other forms of generalized herpes infections with um, Lemtrada um, and also with, um, with, uh, with Cladribine. So I think that that's certainly, you know, of course, if you've already gotten those medications, a lot of it's going to depend, your risk is going to depend on how long ago you got it. So if you got it recently, you know, probably should be self-isolating at this point um, or, and, or, you know, um, at the very least sheltering in place. Um, if it's been a year or more since your last dose, you should talk to your doctor about it and maybe get your, your um, blood work checked to see if you really still have significant um, T cell depletion. Okay, now uh, this is a direct quote from Twitter. What would you say to those who think this is all just media hype? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think it's really understandable that some people feel so scared that they can't even allow the impending reality of COVID-19 into their consciousness at this moment. So I would just say that this isn't a time where we need to, where, where we should be judging or blaming them. We should really be showing each other compassion. This is a, you know, um, particularly those people that are having a hard time coping with our new reality. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, we really only need to read the reports out of France where 12 days ago, many of, uh, many people, including the healthcare workers, were thinking this was no big deal because they only had a few cases of COVID-19 in their, ha in their hospitals. And now they're rapidly becoming overwhelmed. And that just gives us a really good sense of like how quickly we can go from thinking, ho oh, hum, I'm not, you know, all this is over, this is overkill. Why do I need to wash my hands so much and stay out of that crowded grocery store? or stay out of the restaurants, um, but, you know, France and Spain now are turning into the next Italy and Iran. Um, there's a bling of cases every day, and they're running out of protective gear for the healthcare workers and ventilators. I think many of you have seen the news out of Italy and Iran where it has already happened. Um, physicians and nurses have died. They've, they've, you know, been very, very brave and continue to take care of um, patients even after they had run out of protective equipment and sacrifice, sacrifice themselves. They've also had to deny older people ventilators to be able to give it to a younger person so that the younger person can have a chance to live. I think that's a situation you know, none of us would want to be in to have to make those kinds of calls, particularly in the United States where we may be making decisions about taking it away from an uninsured patient um, to give it to somebody with insurance. Um, and if that's not enough, um, you know, one of the, I think one of the saddest pieces of news that's come out recently from Italy is that they can't get the bodies um, to bury their loved ones. They're not allowed to gather for memorial services. So they, you know, I think that's like, um, you know, we want to avoid that happening in this country if we can. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone wants to see a very dark and terrifying video, I actually used a computer software to simulate the potential deaths in the world in the United States with COVID-19, and I'll put up a card in the right upper corner if you want to take a look at that. Now, um, you know, one question I've been getting a lot is how extreme should people be in terms of their hygiene and social isolation? You know, a lot of people are asking if they should stay home from work, but this could go on for months, uh, months and months. How do we make that sort of determination? Yeah, I mean, I think this, this really depends upon where you live. And whether you are on a medication that impairs your T cell function or have other risk factors like being older, uh, being 60 years old or older, being a smoker, diabetic, or having underlying lung disease, um, it's the CDC recommendations um, are, and the, your local health department are changing almost daily, um, both for the people in high risk group and then for all of us. So I think it's really important for us to all sort of stay up to date on what our local health department is recommending and being aware of whether we are considered a high-risk group or not. Um, again, I think the most important thing all of us can do right now is to prevent ourselves from getting infected. 
Um, and um, if you think you already have it, then, um, or you engage in some sort of high-risk behavior, I think it's also really important to prevent um, spreading. Um, and that basically means that if you just got back from like a long-haul flight, or you went to that restaurant or crowded bar that you knew you weren't supposed to go to, um, and somebody was coughing, and you know you might have contact with your grandparents or somebody who's got underlying um, um, health conditions, it's probably, it's, you know, it's the socially responsible thing to do to self-isolate for the next 14 days. If after 14 days you're not, you didn't get a fever, then you don't have it and you don't need to, you can come out of hiding, so to speak. Um, and um, it's important also, I think, to remember that in the United States, it's already circling, circulating across the entire country. So while we don't really know what the true number of cases are um, even when they're low, we know that they're they're doubling almost daily. Um, the the really hard thing is because of the shortage of testing, um, we're only testing people who have a fee even if you have a fever and a cough, but you don't have any underlying risk factors for having a severe case. We're not able to offer testing to those people yet. So um, it's sort of important to keep that in mind. I think. Right now, the goal is to sort of flatten the curve so that not too many people get sick at the same time. And the best way to flat, flatten the curve is to practice social distancing. Um, all of us should be working from home if we can. We should be limiting gatherings to no more than 10 people, keeping a six-foot distance from others outside of the home. We should be washing our hands a lot, um, staying away from places with more than 10 people, like bars, restaurants, even some grocery stores or small spaces where keeping a six-foot distance is like not possible like elevators, um, unless you unless it's absolutely necessary. So I'll tell you what I have told my patients um, who are immunocompromised and my kids. In addition to all of this, no ride services like Ubers or Lyft or public transportation, again, unless you absolutely have to. It's very unlikely that they're being cleaned adequately. And what we know is that now is that the virus can live for up to three days. Um, if you, if you can do it, no food delivery services, it's better to cook at home or designate the healthiest person in your household to go pick up takeout. Um, at least then it's only been touched by the people who are um, preparing the food, not also the delivery guy and his car and, um, you, know, who, who been, you know, who knows if all of that's being sanitized properly. And then I think the hardest thing to, is that, you know, this is going to go on for months. Think long and hard who you want to spend time with and whether that gathering is really, really necessary. Um, think about it not only in terms of yourself, but if you have elderly relatives or, um, relative, or, or friends that are undergoing chemotherapy for cancer, um, in your, you're not sure whether you're sick, maybe don't go to that gathering. Um, I mean, I, what I've told my kids is, you know, pick, you know, 20 friends that you want to see over the next three to four months don't get together with more than, you know, four or five of them at a time and don't get together, don't go to gatherings where there's people that are not off, the, are off that list. That's really a good way to sort of minimize spreading um, the virus to a lot of people um, at one time. It also helps if someone does come down with it, it's easy to remember who you need to notify. Um, you know, uh, that they, you know, and let them know that they, they've been exposed. So, so okay. um, for people who, who do have okay. symptoms, yeah, so people who do have symptom, symptoms, like fever or cough, you should absolutely self-isolate. It's really important to remember that if you have symptoms, of, if you have shortness of breath and fever, you need to seek medical care immediately. Um, because you may be infectious, um, we, most hot places are asking that you call your doctor's office or some sort of hospital hotline to let them know how, um, you, um, how you can be admitted to the hospital in the safest way. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so a few other things. You know, one interesting thing I came across is that Jelenia, the multiple sclerosis medication, Fingolimod, is actually being studied as a potential treatment for acute respiratory distress syndrome in someone who has COVID-19. So if you get COVID-19 and you get pneumonia and you have a lot of alveolar inflammation and you have poor gas exchange, potentially we could reduce that, that inflammation with Jelenia. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I mean, so what what um, what you're getting is that that um, so so we don't know why why does COVID nineteen seem to like just destroy the lungs and it can do it so quickly in people with underlying risk, you know, particularly people who are 
smokers or underlying lung disease or the elderly. And there's two th sort of leading hypotheses. You know, one is that it's the virus itself, that it's just really good at destroying the tissue um, and that you see a lot of immune cells in the lungs because they're trying to clear the virus. But the other theory um, is that the immune system is over... It's it's, it's overactive. It's trying too hard to get rid of the COVID-19, and it's actually the immune cells themselves that are destroying the lung tissue. And it's something that's something called immune reconstitution phenomenon. Um, it's something that we see in patients with Tysab who are on Tysabri and get PML, for instance, and then we stop the Tysabri and they get this overwhelming inflammation in their brain. Um, so if, if that's the correct hypothesis, then giving a agent that can suppress your T-cells and suppress them quickly, the way Gerlenia can, we would expect that to improve the disease scores. The study that they're proposing is to give it to patients who have this overwhelming complica lung complication, and they're giving three doses of Gerlenia three days apart, one dose um, for three days in a row. Um, of course, whether it wor works or not, we don't know. It could make the disease better, but it could also make it worse. If those T cells are there to try and clear the virus, and it's the virus itself doing the damage, we would expect the outcome to be different. This is, of course, extremely different situation than someone who is already on Gelenia for the MS and already has impaired T cell function. So it's by no means a, an indication that Gelenia will some being on Gelenia will reduce your risk of COVID-19 or COVID-19 severity. Um, so I think it's really important to, to uh, remember that, you know, we can't always extrapolate from one hypothesis to another. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, speaking of immunosuppressants, you know, let's say someone does have a multiple sclerosis relapse and we want to give them steroids. Is that safe or should we reconsider that given that steroids also reduce T cell counts? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, the first thing to remember is that um, that any patient who thinks they're having a relapse should check with their neurologist to make sure it's a true MS relapse and not a pseudo-relapse from stress or from, an, from, from like a bladder infection or something like that. And the way your doctor is going to know that is if they examine you. So I would be, I know it's sort of common practice for people to say, hey, I feel like I'm not, you know, I feel like my tingling is back and have the neurologist give them steroids over the phone. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't recommend that. But if you really are having a true relapse and it is significantly impairing your function, then yes, you should get steroids. Um, if you want to be extra cautious, practicing sheltering in, in place for the next 14 days is probably wise. Um, and the reason I say this is that there are actually some reports coming out of Europe that steroid treatment may actually worsen the lung injury caused by COVID-19 rather than improve it. Um, you know, steroids are a standard treatment for, for ARDS, which is the name for that lung, severe lung injury that COVID-19 causes. Um, so if that's true, well, we still don't, we don't have enough data to know for sure if these are simply case reports and associations or if that really is the case. It suggests that the virus is not really like other viruses and um, may be acting in a different way. I think for right, now, right. for MS patients, if you do end up needing high dose steroids, um, you know, it's probably better to be cautious until we know the answer to that question. That makes sense. Um, so the last question I have for you is: the original SARS virus could rarely be neuroinvasive. There were rare case reports where the virus could affect the brain, and they thought that maybe some of the reason that people had this respiratory problem is that the virus was causing inflammation of the brain and reducing the medulla's capacity to initiate respiration. Is that something we should be concerned about with this coronavirus? And does that mean that Tysabri could be unsafe because there could be a risk of encephalitis? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I, when you know, we were talking about this earlier, um, I did try to look it up. There have so far not been any case reports of coronavirus causing um, the COVID-19 um, causing a um, encephalitis or being um, neuroinvasive in any way. So it does, it seems like the main, the main complication really is this severe lung injury. I think it's reassuring, but uh, we'll have to, we'll have to wait until um, our, uh, you know, the outbreaks are over in Italy and uh, Italy and Spain and, France and, and um, talk to our colleagues there. Absolutely. We'll keep an eye on that for sure. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. This was wonderful. It was extremely <laughs> informative. And if you guys have any questions, please post in the comments below and we'll try to answer them. And everyone stay safe and keep your family safe. Have a good day.